Okay, so lastly we have stopped over there. We have seen the variation of uh, the drain current with respect to the drain source voltage. Right, and we have developed the expression for the uh, current. It was something like that. Id is equal to given by uh, mu n c ox w over l uh, vgs minus vth multiplied with vts minus half vts square. And the expression is valid for vgs greater than or equal to vth, that is the threshold voltage. Okay. And we have also drawn this uh, graph for two different values of VGS, say for VGS1 and VGS2, where VGS1 is greater than VGS2. We have seen that initially this particular expression, this I t is equal to some constant multiplied with this uh, overdrive voltage multiplied with VGS minus or VGS square. If you just follow this particular equation uh, mathematically, you will see that initially it will rise and the peak will come. The peak will come at uh, the value of uh, VGS is equal to VGS minus VTH. So, when the drain source voltage is equal to the overdrive voltage, get source minus the threshold x called the overdrive voltage VOD. Then uh, your current reaches the maximum value. Okay. And if you follow this equation mathematically, then you will see that after this, what we should expect from this equation mathematically, it is expected that after this particular point, it is expected that uh, after this point, something like this, both of these two. Okay, but as a circuit designer, you should not like this particular scenario, because as you are increasing the voltage VDS, right, and you are observing that the current is only, that is not something that you look for. You have seen last day that, okay, let me go to the very first slide. The accumulation of the charge, because of the application of the gate source voltage, here it is V1. Once the charge is accumulated, just beneath the oxide layer, for uh, n type of mass, this is basically the electrons. Now once the charge is accumulated, then you are applying some drain source voltage between the two terminals of the device, drain and source. You should expect that as you increase the, so your, uh, say, this particular electron density over here, that is, uh, that is basically a function of uh, the gate source voltage. And once you are applying some voltage between the A and between these two terminals A and B between drain and source, it is acting like a resistance. And as you go on increasing the corresponding uh, drain source voltage, you expect that the current will increase at least. At least it must not fall. You are increasing voltage, your current is falling, that is not a particular scenario which we are looking for. But if you go mathematically, if you follow the expression mathematically, blindly, then it is expected that after this particular point, Vgs minus Vth, the current will drop and will fall. So obviously there is some lacuna, some fallacy is there in the formulation of our expression. What was that lacuna? We will investigate this particular fallacy today. So for that, let me once again just uh, uh, draw the schematic. So basically it is something like this, you have some let me just draw the two dimensional view. So this is your metal, this is the oxide layer, suppose this is your p type substrate, here you have two n plus and the accumulation of electron, something like that, as we have seen last week. Right. Now we are applying some voltage. What are those two voltages? One voltage is between the metal from here to here with respect to source we are applying. Suppose this voltage is nothing but your dead source voltage. 
this is your source terminal let me consider this to be grounded and this is your drain terminal and we are applying some another voltage let it be VDS ok suppose for the timing I am assuming that your substrate is grounded substrate and source both of them are grounded now for the timing let, let me just forget about the substrate let me just uh, consider this particular device uh, I mean it is having only three terminals get drain and source so if you now observe just beneath the oxide layer if you just observe any particular cross section area so it basically acts like a capacitor you have uh, two conductive plate ok the corresponding conductivities are different as I mentioned last day this is p type substrate p plus and then metal in between this metal and semiconductor you have some insulator in the form of silicon dioxide so basically it acts like a capacitor but eventually the voltage that is applied between the two plates of the capacitor these two voltages are not uniform for example here you can expect the metal we are applying some voltage that is VGS get source or let me consider VG only because source is grounded on the top plate you are applying VG but here if you just consider at the source terminal the voltage is applied is equal to zero because that, that is grounded at the drain end what is the voltage that is VDS ok so across the channel as you move suppose uh, this is my uh, let me consider this point to be say let me take different color ok suppose this point corresponds to x equal to 0 and suppose this point corresponds to x equal to L that is the length of the channel so what you observe the voltage across this x this is not at all constant right at x equal to 0 your vx value equal to v0 equal to 0 and at x equal to L the Vx value equal to Vds or Vd right so now if you consider the two plates of the capacitor metal plate and this plate the corresponding voltage over and above the threshold voltage is not constant the voltage that is required for the formation of the channel so what is that voltage we have already calculated this one so that voltage I mean if I consider V1 minus V2 between the two plates of the capacitor so this is nothing but you have VGS minus VTH minus V of X VGS minus VTH minus V of X your gate source voltage is constant for a fixed particular uh, voltage VGS is constant and suppose this is greater than the threshold voltage threshold voltage is fixed so this VGS minus VTH is greater than 0 but you don't have any idea about this VX because these two voltages VDS and VGS they are applied separately there is no relation between them right and you have to ensure that this voltage V1 minus V2 the effective voltage that you are applying between the two plates of the capacitor over and above the threshold voltage so that voltage should be greater than 0 otherwise the channel cannot be formed isn't it the voltage that you are applying at the plate 1 and the voltage that you are applying at the plate 2 the difference between these two that should be greater than threshold so already since I have already taken into account this threshold in, in my expression so that entire thing this u1 minus v2 this entire thing should be greater than 0 you know that vgs is greater than vt that's great Get source voltage is higher than the threshold voltage. So VGS minus VTH is greater than 0. But what about the VX? We don't have any idea. That means what about your VDS? Now suppose this voltage, this V1 minus V2, this particular thing, this will be greater than 0 only if your VGS minus VTH minus this V of X that entire thing we want that this entire thing has to be greater than or equal to 0 or I can write 
VGS minus VTH, this entire thing should be greater than or equal to V of X. Okay. So, what is the minimum value for V of X? That is 0 at X equal to 0. What is the, so the condition says that this overdrive voltage VGS minus VTH, this overdrive voltage should be greater than or equal to V of X and that has to be true for all X. Channel creation condition. Yes. Channel just beneath the offset. Okay. So this overdrive voltage VGS minus VTH or sometimes it is also called VOD, overdrive voltage VOD. So that particular thing should be greater than or equal to the V of X for all X. If this is true for all X, then you can say that this uh, channel will be created. I mean you have the uh, this uh, electrons just beneath the offset here. So, at this particular point, you know that at x equal to 0, your vx equal to 0. So, overdrive voltage is greater than or equal to 0. That condition we have already satisfied. But what happens at this particular end, at x equal to L? At x equal to L, what is the voltage? At x equal to L, the voltage is equal to VTS. Okay. So, if you find that my overdrive voltage VOD if this value is greater than or equal to VTS, then you have sufficient voltage between the two plates of the capacitor. So we have the density of electrons. But remember that density is not uniform. Why not? Because here at the source end, this is my source end, let me just write it down. This is S, this is D. So at the source end, what is effective voltage? VGS minus VTH, I mean VOD, VOD minus 0. So here the voltage is VOD basically. And here the voltage is VOD minus VDS. So obviously the voltage, I mean the effective voltage at the source end is higher as compared to the effective voltage at the drain end. Right. So therefore the distribution of these uh, electrons will not be uniform because you know this expression q is equal to c times v if the dimension is fixed c will be fixed c will be constant but your v is not fixed you are not applying uniform voltage right so the charge density will not be uniform so effectively what you have it will be something like this so here you can expect you have more charge density towards the source end and as you are moving towards the drain end you will see that the corresponding charge density would be reduced something like that now there is a provision it could also happen that the charge density might cease to zero well before the drain end When this condition is not true, when VOD is not greater than or equal to VDS, if this condition is true, if this condition is true, that means your drain source voltage is always less than the overdrive voltage, less than or equal to the overdrive voltage. Okay, that means we are here, we are in this particular zone, that means your drain source voltage is always less than or equal to the overdrive voltage, gate source minus the threshold voltage over here, over here, before the peak. But if your drain source voltage is greater than, if your drain source voltage, if this condition is not true, VOD is not greater than or equal to VDS, then we have to observe what happens beyond this peak. That was the problem which is your started today. Beyond this peak, what happens? When your drain source voltage is just greater than the, the overdrive voltage, VGS minus VTH. That means when this condition is not valid, VOD is not greater than or equal to VDS, I mean VOD is less than VDS, then what happens? What do you expect? If your view, if this condition is not true, that means suppose your VOD is less than VDS. Because these two models are independent. 
So eventually, at the drain end, you don't have any electron concentration. Or I can say that, so uh, if I just, uh, uh, just show the profile by means of by means of this particular thing, let me just uh, yeah. So suppose this is your density of the electrons. Now here you find that okay, the channel, the source and drain, they are connected. Source and drain, they are connected by means of this channel. The electron density reduces from the source end to the drain end, but at the drain end, it is not equal to zero. It is greater than zero as long as your VOD is greater than or equal to VDS. But suppose you have increased the VDS to some extent so that the drain source voltage is greater than the overdrive voltage. Then what happens? You don't have this particular charge density. So this condition is true. So this is true when your VOD is greater than or equal to VDS. Or you can also have this kind of scenario where this is the scenario where VOD is less than VDS. That means the charge density ceases to zero well before the drain end. At this particular point, suppose this point, say for example, let me call uh, let me call this point to be say at x equal to say l dashed. Right. So what do you find? At x equal to l dashed, V G S minus V T H minus V of X, this entire thing is equal to zero. Okay. So when this particular event happens, we call that the channel is spin strong. Channel series to exist well before the drain end. Now if this is the condition, then obviously we have to modify the previous expression that we have already given last. The equation, the starting equation is something like that. I integration 0 to L dx, mu and C ox w integration 0 to Vds. Okay, I assume that okay, Vds is an independent quantity. But remember, when Vds is greater than Vgs minus Vth, right, in that particular case, your channel ceases to exist. So therefore, I have to remodify this particular expression. I cannot keep the highest value of this particular voltage Vx to be any value like Vds. It can have the highest possible value as Vgs minus Vth. Not beyond this. That means your Vds is not an independent quantity. It also depends upon the gate source minus the of the water voltage. Okay. So, had this been the case, Remember this expression, I is I implication 0 to L dx, this particular thing. So, had this been the case, so now let me do this calculation. I integration 0 to L dx, that is equal to mu n C ox W, then you have integration 0 to or should I write Vgs minus Vth? Okay? And then you have Vgs minus Vth minus V of x dvx. So, limit term L dash now. I limit should be 0 to L dash. That's true. But for the time being, let us assume that this. L and L they are very close to each other. Yeah, yes, you are true that it should be 0 to L last. 
But I am assuming for the time being that K and N does have it close. If not, then there will be another effect. We will see to it. For the time being, let us assume that this A and N does, they are almost the same. Okay? So, what I get? I that is equal to mu n c ox w over l. It should be l last. Later on, we will make it l last. For the time, let us assume it is l. What we have over there? Vgs minus Vts minus Vx dvx. We integrate it. What will you get? Vgs minus Vth. Here you have V of X minus half of V of X square that is from 0 to VGS minus VTH, right? So this is VGS minus VTH whole square minus half VGS minus VTH whole square. So ultimately what you get is half mu n C of W over L VGS minus Vth whole square, that is true when Vgs is greater than or equal to Vth and your Vds is greater than or equal to Vgs minus Vth. Right? Surprisingly, the current that we are getting, half mu and C of W over L Vgs minus Vth whole square, is exactly the same of that peak current that you have got last time. Right? So, these values, if you observe this current, the interesting feature is that this particular current is not at all a function of VDS. It's not a function of VDS. It only incorporates the gate source voltage. And the value that you are getting of frequency of W over L VDS minus VDS whole square, this value is essentially this current, this peak current. So whenever your VGS uh, minus VTH is less than VDS or VDS is greater than VDS minus VTH, then the current is no longer reducing. Rather, this current will remain constant. So therefore, this current is no longer reducing and the current is constant. It's constant. It's constant. We have already made an approximation, that's true that L and NLS are same. That's why this constant. If not, then you'll see it's not a term constant. But for the time, it gets assumed that L and NLS are very close and the current is constant. We are happy to some extent, okay, the current doesn't fall. That's a good thing. Okay, we increase the voltage, but the current is remaining constant. At least it doesn't fall. That's a good thing. So once we have this scenario, here you see that the current achieves its maximum value for the timing at least. Later on, you will see that the current is not constant, also increase. But for the timing, let us assume that okay, the current is constant. It is no longer a function of your drain source voltage. Yeah, it's a function of gate source. As gate source is high, you have more current. That's true because if your gate source voltage is more, you have more accumulation of charge carriers, and for a given VDS, your VDS, I mean, the current will be high. But the current value is constant, it is not a function of drain source voltage. So this particular region of operation, this particular region where the current is constant, this particular region of operation is called as the saturation region. Half mu and C of W over L, Vgs minus Vth whole square. Okay? And here the current value depends only on the gate voltage. Call it of the source because source is down there. So, uh, so let's assume that okay, we have two terminals to con control. One is the gate terminal, second one is the drain terminal. So here the current is a function of gate voltage. Assuming that the source is constant, source is grounded. Right? Or you can also say okay, it's a function of gate and source, both of these two. Gate source potential. What about this particular zone where the current increases with respect to your uh, drain source voltage. So here you'll see that the current is a function of both gate source and drain potential. Here the current in the saturation region, the current is a function of only gate source potential. And here 
before this water rate voltage, when the drain source voltage is less than the water rate voltage, then the current is a function of both gate potential, source potential, as well as the drain potential. So that's why this particular region of operation is known as the triode region. Triode region. That is the name. That particular region is saturation region, which current gets saturated, and this region is known as a triode region. Okay? So now let us Now let us uh, formulate the expressions once again. Remember these two expressions. The expression is I is equal to mu n C ox W over L VGS minus VTH times VTS minus half VDS square for VGS to be greater than VTH and VGS minus VTH that particular value should be greater than VDS and the second expression is this is ID second expression is ID is equal to half mu n C ox W over L multiplied with PGS minus VTH whole square for VGS greater than VTH that should be true always because that channel has to be created and VTH should be greater than VGS minus VTH. You can also put the equal sign as an also put difference. Right? Because if you consider these two uh, regions separately, region, saturation region and the uh, triad region, you'll see that uh, the extreme values they match. There is no discontinuity. So that's why this equals and you can put over here. Clear? So the first one is the current expression in the trial region, second one is the current expression in the saturation region. Okay? Now, in these two particular regions, the behavior of the MOS device is not the same. You are observing that in one case the current increases with the voltage, applied voltage. In other case, you will see that the current remains constant. So therefore, the behavior of the device is not the same. Why not? Let me just show you this symbol, MOS symbol. Your MOS looks something like that, NMOS. You have three terminals. This is your gate terminal. This is your drain terminal. This is your source terminal. Okay. Clear. Now, first let us observe what happens in the second phase. What do you see? Suppose you have applied some voltage between the gate and source terminal. This voltage is VGS, for example. Suppose your source is grounded. And externally, you are applying another voltage, say VDS. Okay? Now, what do you see? Suppose, let me... Let me observe this MOS inside this box. You have some current. This current is ID or IDS, ID current and the voltage applied voltage is VDS. You have selected VDS so that this is greater than the overdrive voltage. Your gate source voltage is fixed so that's why I have used some battery. Suppose this is V1. So what is overdrive voltage? V1, VOD. VOD is equal to V1 minus VTH. So you have selected V1 to be higher than VTH so that the device is on. Okay. And now suppose externally you are applying some voltage, some external voltage, which is not a constant voltage, variable voltage. You are adding the VDS value. It's not constant, it's not a battery. I mean, it's variable voltage, right? And you observe the current. What will be your impression? 
Suppose you don't know anything inside this black box. What is happening inside this box? Not in box. What do you feel? Constant current. Even if you change the media, there is no change in the current type. Constant current. So what will be the impression about the device? Yeah, it acts as a current source, an ideal current source, with infinite range. You know that is the property of an ideal current source, infinite resistance. Because as you change the VTS voltage over there, there is no change in the current, ideal. Right? So it acts like a constant current source, only in that particular region. So the bottom line is that you can use the MOS, so you can use MOS as different types of devices. So you can use the MOS as a constant current source whenever you are operating the device in the saturation region. In the integrated circuit design, you have so many things, like you have the resistors, you have the amplifiers, you have the current source, all these things are needed. You'll see that we'll be using current source to bias something. It's not that, the, unlike your uh, discrete circuits, you don't have some separate, uh, I mean, uh, a particular resistor, discrete resistor, you have discrete amplifier, discrete transistor, discrete capacitor, discrete resistor, not like that, discrete current source, not like that. You have only one device, that is MOS, either in MOS or PMOS, you have only one device, and depending upon the region of operation, you can use the same MOS device, as an amplifier sometimes, as a current sometimes, as a resistor sometimes. Okay, so how can you use this MOS as a current source? Whenever you bias the transistor properly. Okay, you have to ensure that this V1 should be greater than VTH and that value, this V1 minus VTH should be less than the, your uh, VTH voltage. If this is true, then you can use the device as a current source. So whenever in your circuit, in some complicated circuit electron, you'll see that okay, there is some current source. So even if this is given by a current source, suppose something like that, suppose you'll observe, okay, there is a current source. Some current, say I1 current. But remember, all that is shown like a current source, but ultimately in the circuit design, this is represented by means of a MOS. Operating in the Clear? And you know, if it is an ideal current source, what should be the resistance in front Got my point? Okay. What happens uh, in the in the triode region? What happens in the triode region? ID is a function of both VGS as well as VGS. And remember, in the in the triode region, the, your VOD value is greater is, is VOD is greater than the drain source voltage. VOD is not less than drain source voltage. So once again, you have ID is equal to some constant multiplied with this, this entire thing. And now, I can simplify this expression to some extent. So what is that simplification? Let us assume that uh, this VGS minus VTH into VTS, this is much, much greater than half VTS square. That means, if you simplify, which suggests, which implies that VTS is much, much less than two times the overdrive voltage, VGS minus VTH. Okay. And if I consider this particular simplification, then what I can write over there in the uh, triad region, I can write ID is equal to, ID is equal to mu n C ox, W or L, VGS minus VTH into VDS, right? So now you see, now the current expression, the current value ID is a function of both the gate source as well as the drain source voltage, right? Now, if I consider the same scenario, I am applying some voltage from outside VDS and if I observe the current ID, so it is no longer constant, some resistance is there. So how to find out the resistance? It's nothing but del ID by del VDS, one upon that. Resistance between these two terminals. So, so what is that? Del ID by del VDS. So del ID, that is basically the inverse of resistance, del ID by del VDS. 
what is that mu n c ox w over l vgs minus vth that means the resistance r if i call it on resistance this on resistance is given by 1 upon mu n c ox w over l vgs minus vth Yeah. So as your overdrive voltage reduces, you have more resistance. Intuitively, it satisfies the notion. As your overdrive voltage is small, you have less charge concentration. That means more resistance. It says that I D uh, R one is equal to one upon mu n C of W over L. That is the constant part. Device dimension is fixed, your <coughs> temperature is fixed, oxide capacitance for MTD is fixed. Your on resistance R on is eventually a function of the water drive voltage and it varies inversely. Okay. Now suppose my condition is true, that means your drain source voltage is less than the water drive voltage, that means the device is operating in the trial region. But your overdrive voltage is also constant, it is not changing. Okay, so in that case, what about this resistance value? This is also constant. Right. So the, if, you know, if you just observe the variation of IT with respect to VDS, this variation should be a linear variation. So if I go to that particular slide over here. What was the condition? The condition was VDS should be much much less than twice of VOD, twice of overdrive voltage. Had this been the case, then your on resistance R on that is constant. So the variation of ID with respect to VDS that's the linear variation, right? So over here. Over this particular range, where suppose this is the range, for example, over here I can observe. Over here I can consider that the variation of this current with respect to the voltage, VDS, additional I with respect to VDS, that is a linear variation. So that's why, and it is also called a deep trial region. Deep trial. That is the beginning of the trial. This is the beginning of the trial from here to here. This is the beginning of the trial. This is the beginning of the trial. And as you are moving towards the lower value of the VDS, keeping your VGS constant, you are moving towards the deep of the trial. And over here, if this condition is true, that means your VDS is much, much less than twice of VOD, then only it is a linear. So that's why this trial region is sometimes also known as a linear region. A deep trial region. Thank you, speaking. Deep trial. The deep trial region, the resistance is constant, R1, that is constant, 1 upon mu and C of W over L, VGS minus VGH. Clear? Yeah. So now I can also use the MOS as a register. As a register. Also, the variable register. How is it possible? If I bias the transistor properly in the trial region. trial region or linear region. So I can use the MOS as a current source in the saturation region. I can use the MOS as a register, as a variable register. Why variable? Because you have got this half mu and C of W over L, which is one is VTH, volume inverse. Now if you change this VTH, it will act as a variable register. Okay, fine. So, we have seen the variation of current ID with respect to one voltage only as of now. If you just, uh, if, if I just consider this variation, uh, last day we have, yeah, last day we have considered the variation of this ID with respect to two different voltages. One is the variation of ID with respect to VDS, keeping VGS constant. And variation of ID with respect to VGS keeping VDS constant. So 
Today we have extensively observed the addition of IT with respect to PDS. One thing we were sure last day that okay, as VDS increases, the current will increase. That is for sure. But how does it increase? Initially, it will increase linearly. Initial takeoff was linear, then parabolic, then constant. Last day, while making this statement, I have told you that okay, I don't know how it will, will it vary, but one thing is very sure that it will pass this 0, 0 line, uh, 0, 0 point, because when the current is voltage is 0, the current should be 0. It will pass the, through this uh, origin, 0, 0 point. And as VDS increases, you have more current initially. So the initial takeoff was linear, we have seen today. Then it will follow the parabolic part. Yeah, obviously it's true. Why is it going to x square? If x is very small, then obviously you can consider that it's, it's almost a linear. Then parabolic, and then eventually constant. Clear? Then we have to observe another variation. Variation of ID with respect to the gate source voltage. Okay, now before we do that, let me just uh, write down on lemma. It was something like this. The lemma is the MOS device. always turns on in saturation when PDS is greater than zero. That is a statement. Whether it is true or false, you have to explain. Most device always turns on in saturation now I understand the difference between the region, saturation linear or track. So the MOS device always turns on in saturation when VDS is greater than VDS. VDS. VDS is greater than zero. VDS is saturation. It is beyond the saturation region. It always turns on in saturation. Suppose the MOS is initially off. Okay. So, say for example, so. Suppose you have a MOS, something like this. You have some voltage, VDS, okay? And this is grounded. And suppose here I am having some variable voltage. Let me say VGS. Okay, it's a variable voltage. You vary from zero to some voltage. So initially when the get source voltage is, suppose your threshold is, for example, uh, threshold is equal to 0 0.3 volt and you are varying this VGS uh, from in this range say 0 to 3 volt and suppose your VGS is equal to constant say let it be say 1 volt. That is constant 1 volt and we are varying the VGS from 0 to 3. So as long as the value is less than 0.3 volt, the device is off. No doubt about that. It's an NMOS. If it is less than threshold, it should be off. Now, when it just crosses 0.3 volt, 0.3 to 1 will be. When it just crosses 0.3 volt, I mean when it just exceeds the threshold voltage, the statement is that the device always turns on in saturation. Always. Always turns on in saturation. What is the condition for a MOS to be in saturation? The condition is that the overdrive voltage should be less than the source voltage. When it is 0 0.3, so as long as your VGS is 0 to 0 0.3 volt, device is off. Device is off. Okay. Now, when VGS just exceeds 0 0.3 volt, just exceeds. What about the overdrive? VOD just greater than just greater than zero. 
slightly greater than 0. What about your VDS that is fixed 1 volt? Which one is higher? VDS is higher with respect to VOD. Okay. So, the device turns on in saturation and you are keeping VDS constant. Since VDS is constant, so the only way by means of which the device can move into the triad region is that you have to increase VGS. So, when VGS increases, suppose the value of VGS is greater than uh, what will be the corresponding value? 1.3. Then the device enters into the triad. Okay. So, the condition is that you know. V G S minus V T H that value should be less than V T S for the device to be in saturation. Okay. So I can also write V G minus V D that value should be less than threshold. So, if your drain voltage is greater than gate voltage for NMOS obviously, for NMOS, if the drain voltage is greater than gate voltage, device is always in saturation. And if the gate voltage exceeds the drain voltage by at least one threshold, then the device enters into the trial. So, I can have, suppose this is your MOS, forget of the source terminal, this is one, this is one terminal. Forget of the source, as long as your gate terminal or as long as your drain terminal is greater than the, I mean the drain voltage is greater than the gate voltage, your device is always in saturation or in MOS. Even if the gate and drain they are at the same potential, then also it is in saturation. Now if the difference between the gate and drain and now if the gate voltage increases for example, and the drain voltage reduces. Now, as long as this difference between gate and drain being gate at the higher potential, as long as the difference is less than the threshold, one threshold, still in saturation. Now, when the difference exceeds one threshold, I mean gate voltage exceeds drain voltage by one threshold, then the device enters into the ground. In the last, in this particular example, the drain voltage was at one volt, gate voltage initially is zero. So, which one is higher? Drain is higher saturation. Then whenever your gate voltage is less than gate, I mean up to 0 to 1, it is still in saturation. At when it is greater than 1, but still the difference is less than 1 threshold, still in saturation. Now when it exceeds 1.3, that means now the gate voltage is at a higher value as compared to the drain voltage and this difference is greater than 1 threshold, now the device enters into the trial. Okay. Is it clear? Now, if you understand this one, then now we can move towards the variation of this ID with respect to gate yes, source. Okay. The variation of ID with respect to gate source, ID versus VGS. You know that as long as your drain voltage, I mean the gate source voltage is less than the threshold voltage, the device will be off. Device is off. Now when the gates when the gate source voltage exceeds the one threshold, right, then now you have to think now to question yourself that in which region, because you know there are two expressions. One is mu and C of double over L, VGS minus VTH into VTH minus half VTH square. 
otherwise half fingers can double over and just and just post go now i have a question at which region the device because ah, this is the off state off state means zero current now this is the take off point okay so which equation to follow It is a constant. Already I have just told you. Just refer to this particular lemma. Device always turns on in saturation. And since since I, I am interested in finding out the variation of ID, I am expecting the non-zero VTS is present. Isn't it? There should be non-zero VTS. Otherwise, the device. I mean, you don't have an ID. So that's why I have made this statement. Well, we got the uh, uh, just uh, showing the variation of ID with respect to VTS. When the device just enters into the, I mean, uh, when the device is becoming just on, then what is the region of operation? Saturation region, right? What is the expression for the current? Saturation region, you know? ID is given by. Half mu n c ox w over l v g s minus v t s whole square. Okay, how does it vary with respect to v g s? I don't know. Okay, gradually. What happens as we are increasing VGS? Okay, it, it should be parabola. Fine. Now suppose you are also changing the VGS because we have not shown the VGS over there. We have not shown the VGS over there. Now if I consider what happens to the device, ID is equal to. Sorry, ID is equal to. In the trial region, the expression was something like that: I D is equal to mu n c ox w over l v g s minus v t h into v d s minus half v d s square. Okay. Now suppose I would like to observe the variation of ID with respect to VGS in the trial. In the saturation region, I already know the expression ID is equal to mu n c of half mu n c of double over VGS minus the whole square. So the variation of ID with respect to VGS, this variation I can give a name to it. Variation of ID with respect to VGS. I mean, del of ID by del of VGS. I can give a name to it. Let me just calculate what is the value. The value is mu n c ox w over l VGS minus VTH. Okay. Any doubt? No doubt. That is the expression del ID of del VGS in the saturation region. What happens in the trial region? In the trial region, what I get del ID upon del VGS, not VDS. Del ID upon del VGS. Okay. In the trial region, del ID by del VGS is nothing but what is that? Mu n c ox. W over L multiplied with VTS only. Remember, it's trial. It's trial. That means your VTS is less than VGS minus VTH. So we have calculated two different expressions. That is in saturation. And that is in triod. Which one is larger? Del ID del VGS at triod or del ID del VGS at saturation? Which one is larger? 
saturation. Saturation. Because the first part is common, frequency of double model. Then you have VDS, then you have VDS minus VDS, and there is restriction on VDS. Yes. Then the VDS will be less than VDS minus VDS. Okay. So the derived LVGS is higher in saturation with respect to the channel. Now we are moving, now we are trying to employ the MOS as an amplifying device. You have seen the MOS as a current source, you have seen the MOS as, as, as a register, simple register. Now we are in the mood to utilize the MOS as, as, a, as an amplifier, amplifying device. What does this particular thing, del ID by del VGS, what does it actually mean? For a given VGS, the amount of cartridge. For a given VGS, amount of current. That means, this particular device, we are observing this MOS as a voltage controlled current source. The, the accumulation of charge, accumulation of electrons for MOS is essentially a function of the gate source voltage. As you have higher gate source voltage, you have more charge density beneath the oxide layer. And therefore, you have more current for a given VDS because the resistance is small, R1 is small. Okay. So, this particular thing, this del ID upon del VGS, that, that is actually for a, for a given VGS value, what is the amount of current that you are getting out of it? And now, if you allow the current to flow through a register, external register, you have the corresponding voltage variation. What is the basic notion of amplification? You have some, some uh, signal variation at the input side and some enlarged signal variation on the output side. That is the basic notion of amplification, as you know from your uh, electron circuits course. You have some input variation at the input side. With respect to that input variation, I would like to have some output variation on output side. Variation of signal output side. So here, as you change the gate source voltage, the corresponding distribution of the charge carriers, electrons for foreign MOS, this distribution is uh, influenced. More gate source voltage means more charge density. More charge density means less resistance. That means more current. And now if you allow the current to flow through a register, external register, current at the output side, that gives rise to voltage variation. So for a given input voltage, if you have a particular case or even for a particular device, depending on the region of operation, for a given input voltage, if you see that the variation of ID is more, that will ultimately give rise to a stronger device, a stronger amplifier. Right? So which one is stronger? I mean, in which region the device is stronger? Saturation. Saturation. Because here, the variation of VG ID with respect to VGS is larger as compared to the trial. Okay? Now, let me give a name to it. Hopefully, you know this name previously. This is nothing but the transconductance and mutual conductance, GM. So, the name is GM, transconductance or mutual conductance. Why mutual? Because input you are applying between the gate and source and output you are observing the current between drain and source. Mutual conductance or transconductance and the value is given by mu n c ox w over l vgs minus vth in the saturation. That is the maximum value, gm max in saturation. Mu n c ox w over l vgs minus vth in saturation. That is the maximum, uh, maximum gm, gm max. So when the device is saturated, when the current is saturated, then that is the maximum GM we can attain. Okay. Now remember, uh, this particular thing, this uh, transconductance, is a function of so many things. We have seen that this transconductance GM is given by mu n c ox w over l 
into VGS minus VTH. This is one expression for this transconduction. Now there are so many things because in the expression of the current, in the expression of the drain current, you have so many things. And out of these so many things, they are independent, they are, they are not independent, rather they are dependent to each other. What are the important characteristics, what are the important parameters that we look that we generally uh, look for? One is the drain current. For a particular uh, construction and for a particular uh, fabrication, for a particular technology, we generally consider mu and Cox to be constant. It's not that important to our calculation. Rather, the parameter that we can vary from the external world is one is the current I T. Second one is the W by L ratio, aspect ratio W by L, and the third one is obviously the order report. So remember these three parameters. They are dependent. I mean, they are interrelated to each other. ID. I am once again referring to the expression in the saturation region only. Half mu and C ox W over L into VGS minus VTH whole square. Now the parameters of interest. Parameters of interest are one is ID. Second one is W by L, and the third one is VGS minus VTH whole square. And accordingly, we can have the variation of GM with respect to these three different parameters. Here we find that uh, GM is given by mu and C of double model VGS minus VTH. That means here only out of these three parameters, ID, W by L, and overdrive voltage, only I have considered two parameters, W by L and overdrive voltage. Okay? I can also write GM as, okay, so what I can do is, well, so let me represent W by L as twice ID. So I can represent, uh, okay, let me do one thing. Let me just uh, get rid of mu and C ox. Okay, so what is mu and C ox? Twice ID or mu and C ox W L is twice ID by VGS minus VTH whole square. Okay, so this mu and C ox W L in center thing is twice ID by VGS minus VTH whole square. But I can write twice ID by VGS minus VTH whole square. So twice ID by VGS minus VTH. Now, if it is told or if it is asked that how does GM vary the overdrive voltage, in one sentence you can't an answer. In the first case, you have seen that GM is equal to mu and C of W by L multiplied with VGS minus VTH. That means it seems that this GM varies linearly, proportionally with, with respect to this overdrive voltage. In the second case, you have seen that GM is equal to twice ID upon this. That is inverse proportional. In one case, you have basically a straight line, first case. Second case is basically hyperbolic. Okay? And finally, you can also get rid of VGS minus VTH. So, same expression. Now, what is VGS minus VTH? Twice ID mu and square root. Okay? So, twice ID, this is nothing but square root of, which is minus bit is how much? Twice ID by mu and square root of the square root. So, twice ID, mu and C ox. W over L. So ultimately, this gives rise to twice ID mu and C of W by L. Say for some cases, you don't have any control over the gate source voltage. You only know the drain current and the aspect ratio. In that case, you will use the last expression. 
If you do not know the drain current definition, then you go for the fast one. If you don't have any idea about the uh, parameters like mu and C or whatever, then you go for the second expression. So there are so many expressions and the value of GM is essentially important. As far as the behavior of the device as an amplifier is concerned. Strong amplifier means larger, larger GM. Weak amplifier means smaller GM. GM is very important. Mutual conductors are transparent. And that value is large in the, uh, that is higher in the saturation region with respect to the trial region. Any doubt up to this? Because they are independent, they, they are not independent, they are related to each other. ID, WI, and VTS, they are, they, are, they, are, they are related to each other. If you keep, okay, I cannot have a particular case where WIL is constant, VGS minus VT is constant, but ID increases. It's never possible. If you just consider this particular expression, this is constant, mu and C is constant, forget about that. You can't have a situation where WIL is constant, overdrive voltage is constant, but the current increases. You can't have that. WIL is independent. WIL is probably the device. WIL change to ID change. No, we can change the WIL. If you consider the layout, if you consider the layout, then we can change it from the outside. For a, for a particular fabrication, suppose for a particular fab lab, you have mu and CFC switch for a particular technology. Mu and CFC switch, but you can change the WIL. In a, in a given circuit, in a given integrated circuit, you have different uh, MOS with different uh, WIL ratio. So, the change going on? We generally, COX is basically the oxide capacitance for the unit area. That's a application related property. A device dimension related problem. Okay, and typically what we, we don't change the width, we typically, typically change the length. Width is also fixed. We typically change the length. Now, whenever you go far from one device to another device, we change the length. Last day I have told you now, we here deal with WIL, not W cross L. We change the current. For a fixed device, it is fixed, but for a, for a particular circuit, you have so many devices. In a given circuit, you have so many devices. For all those devices, your mu and CX is, is constant, but not the WL. Even W is constant, but not PL. Can you get the point? W is constant, but not the L. L is not constant. L is, L is, L is different. Or as you are moving from, say, initially, your length was in, in the range of micro. Say 20 years back, 15 years back, it was in the range of micron. Now it is in the range of. Uh, yeah. 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 Huh? Yeah. What is the present status? It was around minus 6 at 10, so almost say 15 years back. So it's not beta exactly, but in the range of now. Minus 6 to minus 9. But well, this aspect issue, this aspect issue is very important. I can so for a given device, this aspect is fixed. If I change the aspect ratio of the we can have, even for a fixed VGS minus VTH, you can have different currents because the W ratio is different. Okay? So now let me move to the, I, I, I believe that you will be able to uh, draw this variation ID versus, I mean, GM versus VGS minus VTH for a given ID, for a given, uh, for a given uh, WIL and all these things. It is fixed and all. Okay, so now let me move to. If you keep WL constant, or if you keep WL, if you change WL accordingly. No, no. That was the expression, no? So, suppose you, you, for example, suppose VGS minus VTH is increased by root 2 times and W by L is reduced by 2 times. Kind will remain constant. Isn't it? Okay, so now, yeah, now let me go over here. 
it says that i integration 0 to n last dx is equal to mu and c of w integration 0 to vgs minus vth and this entire thing. I have told you that uh, as you for the time being a and n less they are equal. That means if I yeah if I go over there so this difference which we call delta L. So far we have neglected this delta L. We have assumed that okay, delta L uh, can be neglected so that L and L are the same. But that is not the actual case. And that is even more trivial for short channel differences. As the length of the channel is reduced, then that, that approximation may not be valid. And that will give you some erroneous reason. Okay. But one thing can you say, what, what is the impact of this VDS? Uh, what, 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 I mean, how does this VDS will, will, will have any impact on the value of grid type? As VDS increases, what will be the, what will be its impact on grid type? Grid time will also increase. As VDS increases, it will also increase. That is true. And for the time, let us assume that this addition is a linear addition, right? So, what we have done? We have assumed A is equal to L dash. But that is not the case. What I need to do? I have to replace this L by L dash. Then what will be the expression? What is the expression then? id is equal to half mu n c ox w i l dash vgs minus vth whole square right it's not l so that can be written like half mu n c ox w by l vgs minus vth whole square into l by l dash. Okay. So what is that l by l dash? Let us investigate on this. l by what is l dash? l minus delta l. Okay. That is 1 by 1 minus delta L by L. That is equal to 1 minus delta L by L whole inverse. Another approximation. <laughs> 1 minus x whole to the minus 1. Power series, right? 1 plus x only. Only 1 plus x. 1 plus del L by L. Okay. So what about this del L by L? This del L by L is eventually it's proportional to what? VDS. Yes. It's proportional to drain source voltage. That is quite obvious. Now let's put some constant lambda into VDS. Okay. So, the final expression becomes final expression for current ID is equal to go over there half mu n C ox W over L VGS minus VTH whole square multiplied with 1 plus lambda PDS. This lambda is known as the coefficient for I have not used that term yet. <laughs> this is called, okay, this particular thing, this particular event is called whenever the channel is pinched off. When the channel is pinched off well before the drain end, that means the length of the channel gets modulated. We have already uh, studied this uh, modulation now. In your previous uh, yeah, ampere modulation frequency. So, what is the basic 
notion of modulation. Change of something with respect to some other parameters. Your carrier frequency of the signal. Area frequency gets ready with respect to your modulating signal. It's known as what? Frequency modulation. The amplitude of the, suppose that the, uh, the amplitude of this particular carrier signal gets ready. This is known as amplitude modulation. Here's heading, here's modulation. Who is heading actually all those things? Who is the responsible parameter? Your message signal. Isn't it? Your message signal that is any of the properties of the carrier signal. Either the amplitude or the phase or the frequency. If amplitude is added, then amplitude modulation, phase is added, phase modulation, frequency is added, frequency modulation. So here the length of the channel is added. Length of the channel is added. Who is adding this? VDS. VDS. So it is known as channel length modulation. So with channel length modulation, the expression of your drain current becomes half mu and C ox W over L, which is minus VT is whole square into 1 plus lambda VTS. Yeah. So now, now I can't have uh, yeah, so now the expression is modified with channel in modulation. With channel in modulation, this expression becomes oh, here I have already shown that one half mu and C ox W over L VGS minus VTH whole square 1 plus lambda VTS when VGS is greater than or equal to VTH and VDS is greater than or equal to VGS minus VTH and channel modulation is considered. Then the ID is no longer a function of VGS only in the saturation region, rather it's a function of drain source voltage also. How does it vary? Linearly. So you don't have a straight line, I mean, sorry. Yeah. So now it will increase. Okay. And the slope. So previously I have seen that del I D by del V D S. One of them that. That was. Our del ID of our delimitus was 0. Okay, now del ID of delimitus is not equal to 0. Previous, there is no addition of ID with respect to VTS. So del ID of delimitus was 0. So 1 upon that, that means the resistance was infinite. But now del ID of delimitus is not equal to 0. What will be the expression for del ID upon del VTS? What is del ID upon del VTS? Del ID upon del VTS. Not, not in the triad region, but in the saturation region with channel modulation. Channel modulation, if I incorporate this one, then what will be the del ID upon del VTS? This is basically half mu and C of W over L VGS minus VTS whole square multiplied with lambda. Right? And the first thing is nothing but, so this is your half mu n c ox, this, these all are constant, mu n c ox w over l, vgs minus vth whole square, multiplied with lambda. First thing I can, first one I can approximate to id. You may argue why not the last part, I mean this one does not vts part. So that's the approximation sign. This is lambda times id. So what is the resistance? R out in the saturation region, 1 upon del ID by del VTS. That is equal to 1 upon lambda ID. If I neglect channel length modulation, lambda is 0, resistance is infinite. If not, lambda typically 0 0.1, 0 0.2, something like that, voltage inverse. 
0.1.15 volt inverse. So in that case, your R out is no longer an infinite. It's a finite quantity, large but finite quantity. So when you incorporate this channel modulation, then okay, you can also use the MOS as a current source in the saturation region, but not as an ideal current source. It's, it, it becomes a practical current source with a non-infinite output resistance. Okay, initially start with a MOS uh, to be used as a current source in the saturation region. Ideal current source, if I forget about channel modulation, and if I incorporate the channel modulation, then it becomes current source with non-ideal properties. Okay. Right. That is the question. I, I, I would like to answer this question at the at the end of this lecture. Still, since the question is raised already, so I have to give another philosophical point. That uh, it's a very pertinent question. What he has asked. Can you get the question properly? Yes or no? The question was. If, yeah. Initially, I have. Uh, I would like to discuss the mathematics, and then the philosophy. That the question of monodromy is there. It's not. It's not monodromy. So the question is that. Suppose the channel ceases to exist at at x equal to l dash. Right. There is so at x is equal to l dash, the corresponding uh, charge density, which is beneath oxide layer, becomes zero. If the device, if, if the channel is pinched off, then how can I get the current? Or beyond this, beyond this, x is equal to l dash, there is no channel. Still, you can have some current. How is it possible? Is that the question? Can you get the question properly? So now I can give one philosophy. Have you ever seen, say, say for example, let me let me consider any overhead region, any flyover you consider. Suppose three lane or six lane, and say let it be a three lane flyover. The vehicles are moving. Suppose at any point of time, suppose you find that there is a breakdown of one vehicle. What happens? So let me just show you. Suppose you have suppose three lenses are there, or five lenses are there, four lenses are there, something like that. The vehicles are moving, right? At any particular point, say for example over here, suppose there is a Obstruction. There is an obstruction. So, what to typically you find? Typically, you have all the say at this particular point there is an obstruction, and there is a traffic jam just before that. Isn't it? What happens beyond this point? What happens beyond this point? Suppose, or uh, might be it is uh, it is not that narrow. Uh, might be like it is not that narrow. Suppose obstruction is even more bigger, something like that. Suppose there are four lanes, and uh, suppose uh, uh, the accident took place. Uh, Right, accident took place, and out of these four lanes, three lanes are already occupied. Only one lane is left. Right. Now, what happens? What about the behavior of those vehicles on, on, on this particular flight, or on this any road, for example? What do you expect? Uh, so, I can say that at this particular point, so. Actually, you can always uh, visualize the, the, this, uh, the mobility of electrons, the mobility of charge carriers, as the mobility of the vehicles as well. Okay, they are the macro elements, the micro elements. That is the difference. Last day I have given you that example, that is the creation of the channel. The variation in mean, the movement of the people inside in the auditorium. So, the only difference is that they are micro, macro 
and th these are micro elements. But typically, if you just uh, look at the abstraction, the abstraction wise, they are, they are quite similar. So I can say, so what is the what is the notion of channel? Suppose this is the this is the south, this is the north, for example. Some flyover is, I mean, the some flyover is there which connects this south to the north. And because of the presence of this obstruction, this connection between the south, the south and north is completely lost. Or I can say that up to this point, suppose this point is point A, up to this point the connection is there. So I can say that up to this point S to A, the connection is the channel is there. But beyond this point, there is no channel. Because, okay, there is an obstruction. Right. You have only say only one single lane is available for the traffic to pass. Only single lane is available. Now, what do you expect? Beyond this point A, before this point A, there are different vehicles. You might have bus, you might have uh, trucks, you might have uh, say typical uh, typical four wheelers. You can have the scooters. The different types of uh, vehicles are there with different speeds. Their, their, uh, their speed is not the same, velocity is not the same. But once each of them, they face this obstruction at point A, then ultimately, there is a traffic jam. Now, if you just consider the point after A, right at this point, if you, if you have a look at this particular point, you'll see that only one lane is available, single lane is available for the flow of the traffic. And irrespective, and I am assuming that, okay, the length, the wide width of this particular length is such that it can accommodate all those vehicles. It can accommodate bus, it can accommodate truck, it can accommodate the four wheelers as well. Now, if you just take a look at this particular point just beyond the point A, you'll see that irrespective of the velocity of the individual vehicles, all of them, initially, all of them, starts moving at a fixed velocity, at a constant velocity. Okay, beyond this point, after that, then once again, this uh, lane is open to all, then uh, the velocity will be different. But right at this particular point, you can see that the corresponding velocity is almost same for each of these vehicles. Okay, now you can visualize, since the velocity is same, so you can visualize this particular event as having a constant. So the charge, very, I mean the movement of the charge per unit time you consider, that dq dt if I consider, this dq dt is remaining constant beyond this particular point. And once if you observe okay, beyond a to n, suppose the, I mean the, that distance is heavy, I mean uh, this is uh, this is not very close and they are not very close, then once again you can have this variation of the uh, velocity depending upon the type of the vehicles. But here, for, 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 your, for our case, rather, all of them are electrons, assuming that their velocity will be the same. And remember, whenever you have some charge carriers present between S to L dash, source x is equal to 0 to x is equal to L dash, you have some charge carriers. There is some obstruction present over there. But remember, the charges can, they cannot disappear. Charge cannot disappear. So since, okay, you, you may argue that, okay, there is no such channel created, just uh, beneath the oxide ladder, x, x, x equal to L dash, but from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to L dash, you have the plenty of charge carriers present. And already you have applied some electric field. Right, charge carriers are present because of the application of VGS, and uh, you have already applied some electric field between drain and source. Because of this momentum, beyond it, x is equal to L dash, the, all these charge carriers will move, and they will move at a constant rate. That will give rise to a constant current. Whenever you experience any pinch of inside the center. That is an analysis. Can you make this, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, pinch of phenomenon into inside the center? Nearly merge. I have given you this example. If A and N, these two points are not very close. If these two points are not very close, then obviously you don't expect that the current is constant. 
If I assume that okay, this point, these two points are very close, the point of obstruction and the ultimate point of the channel. If these two points are very close, uh, almost constant. Hopefully, I will also uh, explain this kind of uh, scenario. If you ever uh, uh, consider any, any such uh, any such traffic jam on, on a big flyover. Say for example, I don't know whether anybody is having any experience of availing this form uh, of which connects this uh, AC bus road to up to this your uh, EM bypass, almost seven kilometer long. Now, if the traffic jam, if, if that obstruction takes place in the midway, say at Park Circus, for example, then say from Park Circus to <coughs> say EM bypass. Then you have the radiation of this uh, velocity, it's not constant. But if this obstruction takes place, say, at Science City, only one kilometer away, out of seven kilometers, then this, uh, it, you, can, you cannot just visualize, you cannot just perceive the radiation of this velocity. All of them will move at almost at a constant rate. Suppose there is an obstruction at, 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 at uh, say, right at Science City. Breakdown vehicle, some accident took place right at the Science City. Then from Science City to say your uh, this uh, Belekata metro station, only one kilometer. So from this point to that point, this is almost constant. But if this accident took place right at the say Park Circus, which is three kilometer away or four kilometer away from, from your <coughs> extreme point, then you will see that once again the variation of uh, this velocity will, will be there. Can you get the point? When it is very large. No, typically that doesn't happen. Typical that because you are using a very high velocity. You are using very high velocity. Now, ultimately, the accumulation of the charge, because already you have applied, uh, but, uh, I mean, there are two different uh, pin junctions, and they are reverse bias pin junctions. From where you have this uh, plenty of uh, electrons, for name was? Last I told you. We have p type substrate P plus, and in p, p type substrate, you have electrons as the major uh, magnetic carriers. But the accumulation of the charge carriers inside beneath this channel, beneath, beneath this oxide layer, there are different components. One is obviously the magnetic carriers which are present inside this p type substrate. Apart from that, you have applied some reverse bias. It's basically a reverse bias P junction. Typically, what happens initially, since it's a reverse bias P junction, so initially, uh, the layer just beneath the oxide layer is devoid of any mobile charge carriers. So this is nothing but the formation of the repletion layer, as you understand. The formation because for the p-n junction, reverse bias p-n junction, if you increase the reverse bias potential, what happens? The width of the repletion layer will be increased. And here you have two such p junction, source with substrate, drain with substrate. Two p junction, reverse mass by applied voltages in such a way so that these two, these two p junctions they are reverse mass. And then a point will come when it, there is a breakdown. And once it is breakdown, then you have the movement of charge carriers, electrons. You can visualize from different perspective. Okay. Okay, fine. So, so with channel and modulation, we have introduced one such effect, one such secondary effect. I have told you that there are two such secondary effects that we will discuss in this course. One is the channel and modulation. Typically, we assume that okay, air and L dash they might be very close, so we can just neglect the effect of this L dash so that the current is moving almost constant, but that is not the case. If L is uh, L and if uh, if your channel length is short, in that case L and L cannot be met. Another effect we will discuss in the next class that is the, the body effect. As of now, we have not discussed anything about the, the fourth terminal of the device that is the substrate or the body. 
Before we conclude our today's discussion, let me just uh, show you what happens with a P type. It's almost the same. Whenever you study the VLSI, uh, digital VLSI, they will see that both the NMOS and PMOS are present. In CMOS architecture, computer CMOS architecture, you have both NMOS as well as PMOS. But obviously, this PMOS and NMOS, typically uh, construction wise, are almost the same, but uh, there are some changes that I should mention over there. So for a PMOS, what you have? You have this metal layer, you have this oxide layer, and the difference in terms of the substrate now. This is your metal, this is the oxide layer, and PMOS is fabricated on n-type substrate. And here you have two P plus regions which forms the source and the drain and the substrate is uh, n-type. The majority carrier, so obviously the formation of the channel is nothing but the accumulation of holes over there. Accumulation of holes. Accumulation of holes over there. So, for a PMOS to operate properly, the voltage that you are applying in the gate terminal, this voltage should be, for the last case, what you have seen, for NMOS, the applied gate voltage was assuming that the source is grounded. If the source is grounded, let us also consider that this is grounded, for example, this is grounded. Suppose this is my source end, this is source. So here, one second of two plates of the capacitor, metal plate and then the semiconductor plate. Now, since for the P types, uh, for N type substrate, here uh, the charge carrier is basically the holes. So the applied voltage at the gate terminal, at the metal, that should be negative with respect to the source terminal. So here for P type uh, MOS, your gate source voltage should be less than zero. And the mod of VGS should be greater than mod of VTH so that the device becomes on. So here the threshold voltage is negative. For NMOS, you have seen that the threshold is positive. And suppose your threshold voltage for P type uh, PMOS, suppose this value is equal to say minus 0 0.3 volt. So your gate voltage or gate source voltage should be less than minus 0.3 volt. Or mod of VGS value should be greater than. So I, I, I always uh, prefer to use this mod term because whenever you use mod, that becomes this, that that is the same for NMOS as well as for the PMOS. That is easy to remember. Mod of VGS should be greater than mod of VTH so that the device is on. So gate source voltage should be sufficiently negative so that the channel is clear. For the creation of the channel for PMOS, the corresponding uh, voltage, suppose the, the negative voltage that you have to apply is minus point, at least minus point three. Sufficiently negative. So minus point three or minus point four, minus point four. So mod wise, mod VGS should be greater than mod VTH. Okay. In the expression of the, achha, then the next part is that, uh, so that should be drain, drain terminal. So whenever I call it a drain, that means it will actually accept all those holes. Isn't it? That is the notion that that is the, so as, as far as the naming is concerned, source means what? From which, term, I mean that, that particular terminal from which the charge carriers will start traversing. And drain is that particular terminal destination, I can say, where ultimately all the charge carriers will reach. So that is the drain end here. Okay, so already I have put the source at the ground potential. So had this been the case, to allow the holes to move at, at the drain end, this voltage should be, this voltage should be negative with respect to source. 
isn't it? Unlike your NMOS. Because here the charge fields are holes, not the electrons. So that voltage, so at the source end the voltage is zero. So at the drain end the voltage should be negative. Or I can say that VTS is less than zero. For NMOS, you have seen that VTS is greater than zero. For PMOS, VTS is less than zero. Typically, what is done? Typically, this is not done in, in, in a given circuit. Typically, the source is not grounded for PMOS. Rather, the source is kept at the highest potential. Source is at say VDD or the highest potential, 3 volt. And with respect to source, the drain potential is less. For NMOS, what we find in NMOS, the drain potential is greater than the source potential. And for the PMOS, so absolutely I say, for PMOS you see, VDS, this drain source, should be less than zero. Then only you can have the current flow. You can make it greater than zero. If VDS is greater than zero, then the role of this drain and source will be just the reverse. Okay, so typically as I have also mentioned last day, typically this is the symbol for PMOS. This is the source terminal with which the arrow is indicated. This is the drain terminal. Typically the drain is at a lower potential as compared to the source terminal. If you keep this drain potential at a higher as compared to the source potential, then the movement of the current, will be, I mean the direction of the current will be just the opposite. This is, or this particular thing, this indicates the current will move from here to here. The current will move from the source to the drain. Because the charge carriers are moving from source to the drain. Here the charge carriers are holes. So direction of the hole is equal to the direction of the positive, positive current. So here the current will move, I mean the holes will move in that way, no? Source to drain, source of charge carriers, drain off, or destination of charge carriers. So the currents, so the charge carriers are moving from source end to the drain end. Positively charged carriers, holes, mobile charge carriers. So the current will also flow from source to drain. So that's why this is the typical direction. But if your drain voltage is greater than source voltage, anybody can do that. Nobody will stop you. But in PMOS, you can also keep the drain voltage higher as compared to the source voltage. Then the current direction will be the same. Currently, have one of the PMOS and 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 PMOS yeah, it's a symmetric device. It's a symmetric device. So typically what is done, we, we don't keep the source potential at zero. That, that is our normal practice. For NMOS, we keep the source potential at zero and also the body potential at zero, uh, bulk or substrate potential. And for PMOS, what you do, the source or substrate, both of them are connected to the highest potential. So that this body effect is not there. Okay, the next part is that how I can ensure that the channel is, is not pinched off or even if it is pinched off then what is the condition. Last time you have seen that this effective voltage, this effective voltage if I just once again refer to that slide, yes, the condition was that V1 minus V2, Vgs minus Vt is minus Vx, so that entire thing should be greater than zero. If it is zero, greater than zero, then the channel is not pinched off. Here the condition is just the reverse. Can you get the point? You have two plates, V1 and V2. So V1 minus V2, if this value is less than 0, 
whenever I am writing V1, I should incorporate the threshold voltage within that. If it is less than zero, then for the entire duration of the, for the entire length of the channel, then the channel is not pitched on. Just the reverse. So, what was the condition for in most to win saturation? VD is greater than the overdrive. VD is greater than the overdrive. Yet the condition is just the reverse. VD is less than overdrive. For in MOS, the condition was VDS should be greater than the overdrive voltage. Or I have told you that gate is at a higher potential as with respect to drain by at least one threshold. Right. So here, then only the device enters into the trial. If the drain is at a higher voltage as from, drain is at a higher potential as with respect to gate, then the device is obviously in a saturation. If both of them are at the same potential, then also the device is in saturation. If the gate voltage is higher than drain by at least one threshold, then the device enters into the trial for NMOS. And here, here is the reverse one. Here the drain voltage should be greater than the gate voltage by at least one threshold and here the threshold is negative so mod of threshold then the device is in then the device is in triode Last time, if VDS, the easy way to remember, I am just uh, mentioning, yeah, for NMOS, the easy way to remember, NMOS, the condition was VDS should be greater than or equal to VGS minus VTH, then the device is in saturation, right? That means if I take this source, uh, because in both of these two cases you have the source, I can take uh, VD minus VG, that should be greater than VTH. Same thing. Okay. So VD minus VG greater than VTH or VTHN, that is always positive. VTHN is positive for NMOS. So that is the condition for the NMOS to be in saturation. And remember, PMOS is just the reverse. So, it says that the drain voltage should be greater than the gate voltage by at least one threshold. Then the device will be in saturation. For the PMOS, it is just the reverse. See, the drain voltage minus gate voltage, that difference is greater than mod of threshold, one threshold, mod of one, because here the threshold is negative. If it is greater than mod of threshold, then the device will be in trial. So, easy. Negative. But the difference I am talking about. I am talking about the difference because whenever you write down the expression 1 plus lambda VDS, lambda VGS, uh, VGS minus VTS whole square, remember this VGS is negative here. But consider that expression, don't use the minus sign, otherwise it will be confusing. Otherwise it will be confusing, don't use the minus sign. Use the same expression, same expression value. Here for the PMOS, the expression for the current is just this one. You can write down this expression. The current expression ID is equal to in the saturation region, I can write it down like half mu p c ox w over l vgs minus vth whole square 1 plus lambda vds. Remember, here this vgs minus v, uh, vgs is basically negative. 
VTHP is negative. So don't use minus sign over there or minus or minus VTHP. Don't, don't do that. Otherwise, it will create some confusion. Where to use the same expression? VGS minus VTHP. If you keep negative voltage for VGS, negative voltage for VTHP. Multiply with 1 plus lambda VDS. Keep it negative. VDS is not positive, unlike your in MOS case, it is negative. Sir, which is negative line does minus VTH of it. Hmm. Vt minus Vt equals to minus Vt. Oh, I have put uh, a mistake over there. Yeah. 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 Thanks for pointing it out. Basically, here the condition for saturation is that Vg minus Vt. Vg minus Vt greater than Vt. Vt is so for for the device to be in saturation, for N MOS, for the device to be in saturation, your drain source voltage. Drain source voltage should be greater than the gate source minus the threshold voltage. Or in other words, what I can say is that this this one Vg minus V <coughs> to be in saturation. That means if your gate voltage, if your gate voltage is greater than drain voltage within one threshold, within one threshold then the device is in saturation. If the gate voltage is higher than drain voltage by more than one threshold, then the device enters into the triad. Okay. So in the next class, we will. Uh, I am having some uh, numerical problems, and if you understand the notion of this uh, N MOS, P MOS, and uh, the different regions operations, saturation, then off region, off state, and as well as the triad region, then with some given uh, scenario, you can understand uh, what is the status, what is the state of that particular uh, MOS, and what about the corresponding current expression. We'll do some uh, numerical problem in the next class. So with this, let me stop it.